Welcome to the August 2024 episode of Diabetes Care On Air, a fun way to bring the research in diabetes care to life. My name is Mike Rickles from the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm Alice Chang from the University of Toronto, and we are your co-hosts for this podcast series. As per usual, Alice and I will interview authors of feature articles as selected by the editors of Diabetes Care, followed by a rapid exchange segment where we give brief summaries of articles we found of particular interest. Before we get started, though, I want to remind our listeners that this is the last month to access sessions online from the annual scientific sessions held in June in Orlando. Whether you registered in advance of the meeting or since, and you still can, you will have access to content through August 26 at ada2024.org. So don't forget to check out those sessions you couldn't get to during the meeting or only learned about since. Well, let's get started with the content of the August 2024 issue of Diabetes Care. In the August 2024 issue of Diabetes Care, one of the feature articles is entitled Consensus Guidance for Monitoring Individuals with Islet Autoantibody Positive Pre-Stage 3 Type 1 Diabetes. I'm delighted that joining us are the article's corresponding author, Dr. Anastasia Albanese O'Neill, and the article's last author, Dr. Linda DeMeglio. Dr. Albanese O'Neill is Associate Vice President at Breakthrough T1D, formerly known as the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, or JDRF. And Dr. DeMeglio is the Edwin Letzer Professor of Pediatrics and Chief of the Division of Pediatric Endocrinology at Indiana University School of Medicine in Indianapolis. Welcome, Anastasia and Linda. I'm so glad you could both join us. Thank you for having us. We are very glad to be here. Yes, thank you so much for the invitation. And we just want to recognize that the paper's first author, Professor Moshe Phillip, couldn't be with us today, but he's here in spirit and hopefully echoed in this conversation. Well, thank you and congratulations to you both, Moshe, and your colleagues on this feature article. We've been covering a lot of original research on this podcast, addressing risk for progression and opportunities for intervention during the preclinical or pre-symptomatic stages of type 1 diabetes. And so this guidance document is really timely. Anastasia, starting with you, could you please tell us what prompted the JDRF, now Breakthrough T1D, to take on organizing this consensus guidance for monitoring individuals with pre-symptomatic type 1 diabetes and the process you all went through to develop the article's recommendations? Absolutely. I'm happy to respond to that question. We have to go backwards in time a little bit to 2022. And at the time, Breakthrough T1D, then JDRF, was doing an analysis of what were some of the barriers to expanding screening? You know, we were funding screening all over the world, and we screened a few hundred thousand people here in the U.S. through TrialNet and programs like ASK and several hundred thousand more in Europe. But I think as clinicians, we often think very carefully when we order labs, and we don't want to order a lab when we don't know what to do with the result. And in a review of the clinical guidance, there was a pretty clear gap about what to do when somebody came back with positive results in the clinical setting. Simultaneously that year, and again going back in time in 2022, the American Diabetes Association in its standards of care slightly expanded its screening guidelines in type 1 diabetes, and they added a sentence that in addition to screening in a research study, it could be considered an option for first-degree family members of a program with type 1 diabetes in the clinical setting. And so we started thinking about what are we going to do when people come back with positive results? And so we turned to extraordinary leaders in the field, Linda DeMeglio, who's here with us today, and Moshe Phillip, and we asked them the question, would you be willing to lead an effort to reach international consensus on monitoring individuals who are autoantibody positive and in the early stages of type 1 diabetes? And thankfully, they both said yes. So we had some pre-planning meetings. We invited some people to a meeting in Berlin, Germany, attached to the ATTD meeting. We weren't sure who would show up. We weren't sure if they'd be enthusiastic about the project or not. But it turns out there was almost universal 
enthusiasm for getting a consensus guideline in place. So we had some really excellent presentations on the evidence in Berlin back in early 2023. We had a lot of interim conversations. In the meantime, we recruited some other experts like John Wentworth and Rivka Schulman Rosenbaum and Kurt Griffin and others to lead these subgroups who met a number of times virtually across time zones on four continents. We met again at ADA where we had version 6.6 .6 of the document. Then we brought in other societies like ADA, ACE, the Endocrine Society, ADCES, ISPAD, everyone joined in and we had more people at the meeting at ADA. And finally, we got to version 28 of the document, which is the one that you see in print, but it's a true consensus. Every author and other observers had a piece in this, and I think it really represents the collective expertise, including representatives from primary care. So I'm really delighted because I think there are a lot of people who have ownership of this document, and I'm just here to talk about it today. That's great, Anastasia. And our current model for staging type 1 diabetes comes largely from longitudinal studies that have involved individuals with the family history. Like you mentioned, the ADA recommendations came out saying, consider screening for family members of individuals with type 1 diabetes. And so some of the longitudinal studies also evaluated elevated HLA genetic risk. And most of those studies involve children. And so what we don't know as much about is when type 1 diabetes develops in adults, yet more individuals are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes as adults than as children. Most do not have a family history of type 1 diabetes, and many only have a single islet autoantibody. And so I want to turn to you now, Linda. How have the lessons from pediatrics and the longitudinal cohort studies of families affected with type 1 diabetes that have led to our staging model, how have that been incorporated into recommendations for monitoring autoantibody positive adults in these guidelines? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think it is really important that we have to note that we had to really extrapolate a lot to be able to get to guidance for adults. So I'm a pediatric endocrinologist. Moshe is a pediatric endocrinologist. Anastasia has spent a lot of her career in peds. So I did raise my hand and I was the representative to the adult group from the um, kind of executive group that worked on these guidelines. And I got to listen to a lot of great discussions in the adult endocrine space. The guidance that we have today typically reflects pediatric data and we need more data for adults. So even though trial net data includes adults less than 45, uh, we still mostly have pediatric data, even the trial net data set. The data we have also typically reflect persons of European ancestry. So we need also more diverse data sets. So the recommendations and the guidance are framed as expert clinical advice, in part because we didn't have enough in the guidance to really make it be guidelines. We had to stay focused with the adult group in particular that the goals for monitoring are to avoid DKA, provide access to disease modifying therapies, and provide access for people that are interested in research. So we used the data that existed from children to inform adults. The adult group discussed extensively that adults will progress more slowly than children, which was important to know. So the urgency of diagnosis of stage three or clinically evident diabetes would probably be more insidious and that adults have more regular monitoring for diabetes status, so like more routine A1Cs, things like that, that were done. We know that adults are often also misdiagnosed as type 2, so that was taken into account. And we also talked a lot about, and there's a section in the guidance about pregnancy in adults and ways to take care of people that were pregnant who had positive antibodies. Like in pediatrics, there was a very important emphasis put throughout the guidance on education and psychological support for adults living with multiple autoantibodies and for importance of that as an ongoing part of monitoring. Great. And one of the arguments for monitoring that you mentioned, Linda, that is individuals who've screened positive for at least one islet autoantibody are at increased risk for future diabetic ketoacidosis. And so to prevent that is an important goal of providing ongoing monitoring. Anastasia, turning to you now, why is this so important? Or in other words, how do providers, practitioners communicate the importance of avoiding DKA to individuals who they're recommending to undergo ongoing monitoring? Yeah, 
That's a, a great question. So let's start with DKA. I mean, we all know on this call and for your listeners, DKA is a very distressing experience, especially at diagnosis for people with type 1 diabetes. We hear that a lot as a patient advocacy organization here at Breakthrough T1D, formerly JDRF. And in fact, another impetus for this monitoring guidance, certainly it was a clear clinical need, but also hearing the voices of individuals in the type 1 diabetes community who were diagnosed in DKA, and some of them knew they were autoantibody positive and ended up diagnosed in DKA anyway, both as children and as adults. So this guidance was really important to make sure that as a multidisciplinary care team, including primary care, we we're all focused on realizing this benefit of screening. It's a benefit of screening. So that is really key. What we also know, Michael, is that from research over the past 40 years, when you look at the FRIDA study, when you look at the AS study, when you look at the TEDDY study, when you look at DAISY, whether it was a general population study or a first degree relatives, what we found was not just screening, but also monitoring led to a very significant reduction in DKA, in fact, lower than 3%. And people who got education in the FRIDA study, DKA rates were around 2%. When you think about the current state of affairs in the United States and around the world, the rates vary somewhere between 20 and 70% at diagnosis, around 50% for children and adolescents. This is an immediate clinical benefit we can realize through monitoring. But how do we do that? Well, we need to make sure that everybody's educated about this new guidance. And that's not just specialists who contributed to them or specialists who work in endocrinology or diabetes, but everyone in primary care. And what's forthcoming this fall, which many people may not be aware of yet, are actual ICD-10 codes for early stage type 1 diabetes for a diagnosis in stage 1 or stage 2, which would flag a provider or a healthcare professional to think wait, they've got this diagnosis, they've got positive autoantibodies. If these are confirmed and persistent over time, the likelihood of progression to a stage three diagnosis is very high. I need to get a monitoring plan in place in partnership with this patient or this family and the guidance is there to help them do it. So it's really a community effort in healthcare and also really educating the community when you've got positive autoantibodies to self-advocate for this care with your care team, whether it's primary care or specialty care. That's great. And I want to just take a moment to go over for our listeners, the islet autoantibodies that we're talking about. And so the monitoring for multiple autoantibodies should include measuring those against insulin, glutamic acid decarboxylase or GAD, islet antigen 2 or IA2, and the zinc transporter type 8 or ZNT8. And so a first positive result should be confirmed with a second test within three months, preferably using a laboratory that meets the performance standards set by the islet autoantibody standardization program. But as your, your guidance points out, if you're not sure about that or you know, there's still a need to put metabolic monitoring in place if you've identified someone who's testing positive, say you're not sure about the laboratory, but hey, this is still identifying somebody at risk. So we know that two or more confirmed positive islet autoantibodies defines then stage one type one diabetes. And then the metabolic monitoring helps us get to stage two type one diabetes. And so that requires this additional presence of dysglycemia. And so since there's now intervention with teplizumab that's available in, at least in the United States and some countries for stage two type one diabetes, understanding how to identify dysglycemia in clinical practice is really important. So Linda, turning back to you now, how are these guidelines recommending we define dysglycemia? And I'm really interested in your thoughts on the criteria for using continuous glucose monitoring. Yeah, well, the criteria for the dysglycemia are derived primarily from OGTT, so oral glucose tolerance test results, and aligned with current ADA standards of care. So we did get endorsement of these guidelines from the ADA, from EASD, from a number of different organizations in order to do that. We weren't looking to blaze new territory here. We aligned with standard definitions. So briefly, that includes like a fasting plasma glucose of 100 to 125, the two-hour OGTT of a 140 to 199 milligrams per deciliter, intermediate time points on the OGTT over 200, or an A1C between 5.7 and 6.4%. 
We also, though, did consider the use of CGM, and I will say this is one place where it's kind of footnoted in the guidance and mentioned different places. We did not meet consensus on CGM. So several people have suggested in data have been published that 10% time on a CGM over 140 milligrams per deciliter can be indicative of stage two diabetes. Note that has to be confirmed with the second glucose test because you don't want to rely on a single CGM tracing. But although many of the authors and people on the guidance really felt that CGM was ready for prime time, several of the authors have published on this previously, and it could be considered diagnostic. Others really felt that there were not enough data. And so I think that this is an area of active research. Actually, I know that Breakthrough T1D has now funded some new projects in this area to try to get better analyses of CGM. And I think I'd wait and see, but I think that it's highly suggestive. And I know that we have been using it clinically as a suggestive time point. I don't know that it's enough to get insurance approval for things like teplizumab at this point, but it's certainly intriguing and it did make it in there, just not with consensus. So supportive at this point, but needs to have another more traditional glucose indicator present. Well, yeah, it depends on which side of the aisle you were on there. So there would be certainly authors that would argue that that it was ready, but we could not get consensus there. All right. And so Anastasia, turning back to you now, once an individual is determined to be at risk, and let's say even prior to identifying this glycemia with a confirmed islet autoantibody positive status, what is the recommended monitoring frequency for identifying progression of either the autoimmunity or the, the metabolic dysfunction? So before I answer it, I want to do a few thank yous. And importantly, I want to thank Rachel Besser and Kurt Griffin, who led our pediatric working group. I want to thank John Wentworth and Rivka Schulman-Rosenbaum, who led our adult working group. And then we had some subgroups of the pediatric group, and we need to thank those folks too. And that is Jenny Cooper, Maria Craig, Kimber Simmons, and Rita Viola, who all contributed in a variety of ways to that working group. Let's start with single autoantibody status, because as you noted, the staging criteria starts with, in stage one, people who have two or more persistent autoantibodies and normal glycemia. But what do we do about people who are single autoantibody positive? And the group felt that it was really important to address this unique group of individuals who we can call at risk for type 1 diabetes. If we think of people who are staged, who have two or more persistent autoantibodies, or have two or more persistent autoantibodies and dysglycemia, so in stage two, that group of individuals is very likely to progress. In fact, the current standards of care at the American Diabetes Association state very clearly have almost 100% likelihood of progression to type 1 diabetes over their lifetime. But what do we do about these single autoantibody positive individuals? In children, there was more urgency from the group. And why is that? Because the disease progression happens more quickly in children, is more aggressive. And we do see children who are single autoantibody positive progress. And so there is some guidance in the document looking at these children, especially very young children under the age of three years old, who we want to follow a bit more closely. So for example, in that case, we would want to check autoantibody status every six months for three years, and then annually after that for another three years to make sure they don't seroconvert and present with the second autoantibody. That's also accompanied with metabolic monitoring as well in this young age group. But when children get a little bit older, ages three to nine, we will be a little bit less aggressive with these children in the at-risk or single autoantibody category, making sure that they don't either seroconvert to add a second autoantibody or progress with that single autoantibody to a clinical diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. In adults, that single autoantibody monitoring is a bit less aggressive, but there are still recommendations that it's followed because we sometimes more rarely, and again, we don't have a lot of data on adults, do see people progress to a diagnosis of clinical type 1 diabetes. Now, what about children who are in stage 1 type 1 diabetes? Well, and for anybody, whether they're single or double positive or multiple positive, three or more, We need to do confirmatory testing, which you mentioned earlier. So the guidance is broken out for children and adolescents based on stage. In stage one, education is paramount, the need for monitoring, the symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis, providing written instructions, and providing people with blood glucose meter and test strips, and checking glucose with intercurrent illness, et cetera. And then 
We also want to continue to monitor metabolically these children. So the methods may vary depending on the setting and resources, which could include A1C or CGM, which has some controversy around it, as Linda noted, OGTT and structured home self-monitoring of blood glucose. And there is some age stratified guidance in the document for these kids in stage one. In stage two type one diabetes, we're really looking at a referral to specialty care or endocrinology, of course, continuing with education and providing the resources for self-monitoring at home and close monitoring of metabolic status every three months. So increasing that frequency. But again, for stage two type one diabetes in children, people who have two or more persistent autoantibodies and are dysglycemic, we want to get them to specialty care. For adults, How is monitoring different in adults versus kids? Well, we know a lot less about adults, as you and Linda have mentioned. There's this challenge of misdiagnosis in adults, misdiagnosed initially with type 2 diabetes who actually have type 1 diabetes. The progression is slower in adults. And of course, we have pregnancy in this population. And so I think I just want to underline that there are a lot of gaps in the evidence base in the adult monitoring. And what you will note is that there are a lot of advice points in this section are rated as e-expert opinion because we do need more evidence and we're hopeful that more people will want to engage in research in the adult space. So if you're listening to this podcast, I hope you will take that as an invitation to suggest some studies. Again, with adults, single or double positive, and I'll talk about the double positive now in stage one, type one diabetes, we want to confirm the persistence with a second sample Again, prefer a reference laboratory. We want to provide them the ability to self-monitor their blood glucose at home. In adults in stage one, we want to repeat the A1C every 12 months, ideally as part of primary care with a comprehensive metabolic panel or some other test that you might be doing. And in stage two, as in pediatrics, we want to refer to an endocrinologist. We want to increase the pace or the cadence of that metabolic monitoring to every six months. And there are other considerations in the guidance for people to read about. That's great, Anastasia. So hearing a lot about the critical role that primary care practice is going to play in individuals in stage one for providing that ongoing metabolic monitoring until there's evidence of dysglycemia, and then how it's so important once dysglycemia has developed to get plugged into endocrinology practice where there may be opportunities for interventions, as well as potential clinical trials or more close risk assessment for identifying an early diagnosis of clinical diabetes before something like DK, as we talked about, it occurs. And what I think is really nice about the monitoring recommendations, and I know this the CGM, sure, there'll be some controversy on how well accepted that is, but I, I think as you point out, Anastasia, there, were, there are options in there for the intensive home monitoring as well as EA1C and OGTTT, but it didn't all rely on the OGTT. And so I think that that's helpful because requiring an oral glucose tolerance test can be really logistically challenging for individuals to keep up with on a routine basis. And so another monitoring concept that I learned in your article, and I'm going to turn to you, Linda, with this is this concept that if hemoglobin A1C increases by 10% over time, which is, for example, going from 5.0 to 5.5%, which is within the normal range, but that amount of an increase should prompt then consideration of, oh, now let's let's get an oral glucose tolerance test and and see where we're at. Linda, can you say more about this recommendation? Yeah, this is one of my takeaway points too from the guidance, which builds on data from the DIP study and then later the TEDI study and then trial net studies as well that have shown that a 10% increase in A1C when associated with other markers, so things like multiple autoantibodies, is associated with increased risk. So by itself, a 10% increase, you know, given variability in the lab may not mean much. But once you've got multiple autoantibodies, it really increased your positive predictive value for developing stage 3 diabetes. Now, it's important to recognize that these data were enough to come to consensus in the guidance, so we were able to get there. But the data were obtained in children. So while the pediatric group gave the 10% increase in A1C as being moving into stage 2 diabetes, a B level of evidence. The adult group in the consensus guidance rated this only as an E level recommendation. So I think it highlights 
how much is left to be done. Let me just pause here to say briefly that of all the recommendations in the guidance, over two thirds were E-level evidence. So there is a, a need for a lot of a, additional data in this space. Although other than CGM, we were able to come to consensus, I think, on nearly everything else that's published there, which is good. Great. Now, finally then, Anastasia, Linda, any final takeaway messages for our listeners? Well, I have two, if that's okay. The, the first is, I think we are all delighted and very proud that this guidance includes educational advice and also advice for psychological support. And I really want to thank the co-leads there, Laura Smith and Kimberly Driscoll, for the psychological section. And then Kirstine Bell and Brigitte Fronert for the educational section. There's more work to be done, as Linda has indicated, but this is a start. I'd encourage people to, again, think about opportunities here about how we do both of these things better. This is kind of a, it's really, this is an inflection point in clinical care. This is a group of people that we haven't seen in specialty care or in primary care before, really, in terms of monitoring guidance. So very important there. And I just wanted to sort of revisit this question about the collaboration with primary care. You know, I taught advanced pathophysiology to nurse practitioners when I was at the University of Florida, and I did not talk about the staging criteria when I taught that class. I would like to go back to 2016 and find myself in that era and include that in that series of lectures. And so really, I, I think a takeaway is that folks in primary care should understand the stages of type 1 diabetes and be thinking about monitoring, either immunological monitoring or metabolic monitoring in their practice setting in early stage type 1 diabetes as they move forward in practice. And I, I think that this monitor can take place wherever there is sufficient expertise and know how to do it. And I think this really has got to be a partnership between primary and specialty care. And we need to work together as this, this knowledge is diffused across the healthcare landscape. I think that those are all great points. I'll say that the guidance ends with a table of unmet needs, and some of them are really big research needs and some are unmet clinical needs. A couple additional ones, the ones that Anastasia has highlighted already that I'd like to add in is just the cost effectiveness of monitoring strategies, how they'll work in different settings. So we had international representation of the guidance, which was really important. But I think that that's going to be critical. And then how we get access to the people that are needed, particularly the people for the psychological and social support and educational needs of these persons who are living with early stage diabetes. And like most of the people listening to this podcast, we did not learn about this early in our training, the stages of diabetes and this idea of how to monitor these people, especially people from the general population that are antibody positive is, is really very critical. So we appreciate your highlighting it in this forum. And I'll just note that the guidance is freely available. It's open access online, and we hope people will use it as a reference tool. Well, Dr. Anastasia Albanese O'Neill and Linda DeMeglio, thank you both so much for sharing your expertise with us today. I'm certainly grateful for all the practical advice regarding monitoring individuals with presymptomatic type 1 diabetes that I took away from your article and our discussion. And I believe your guidance will have important clinical impact on clinical practice. I encourage our listeners to access the full article in the August issue of Diabetes Care. One of the feature articles from the August 2024 issue of Diabetes Care is a very important consensus report entitled Hyperglycemic Crises in Adults with Diabetes, a Consensus Report, by an international expert panel led by Dr. Guillermo Ampires, endocrinologist and researcher, professor of medicine at the Emory University School of Medicine, and past president for medicine and science for the American Diabetes Association. Thank you so much, Guillermo, for agreeing to be part of this podcast, and a huge congratulations to you and your colleagues for this tremendous report. Thank you, Alice. It's so nice that the ADA finally accepted to update these guidelines. Absolutely. I mean, this consensus report serves as an update of the ADA consensus statement on hyperglycemic crises published in 2001, and then you updated in 2009. So you're right. It's a long time coming, and we've been eagerly awaiting this particular update. And like all consensus reports, I know very well it's a labor of love and commitment by a dedicated group of experts. So can you tell us what inspired this update and how did you go about creating it? So first, 
discussing with the ADA, with the executive committee, we thought that in the previous guidelines, we only had people related to the ADA. But now we decided to invite several organizations to make this a global consensus, not just an ADA consensus. So we invited the European Association of Study of Diabetes. We invited the UK Diabetes, the Joint British Diabetes Society, the American College of Endocrinology and Diabetes Technology Society. And as you said, the first guidelines, the first update or consensus was done in 2001, was led by Avi Kitabchi and was reviewed in 2006, 2009. So at that time from now, there have been over 7,000 or close to 7,000 publications from DKA AHS. Most of them review papers and some randomized observational studies. So what we decided to do was to review the literature extensively from 2009, the last consensus, to November, September of last year, 2023. And this is what we have. So the objective is to provide an up-to-date knowledge on pathophysiology, epidemiology, how we should diagnose, how we should treat, not only in the hospital when the patient go home, and the target was intended for everybody who is involved in diabetes care, professionals, pharmacists, nurses, industry, patients with diabetes. Now, we certainly cannot cover the entire document in this short podcast interview, but let's discuss some of the key highlights from the various sections. Maybe we can start with the global trends in the epidemiology and outcomes of hyperglycemic crises. What are some of the, the key highlights there? There are several reports from the United States, Europe, and other countries that the number of patients with diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic states have increased substantially all over the world. So maybe it relates to the increased number of type 1 diabetes and, of course, the amazing number of patients with type 2 diabetes. And we realized that, first, diabetic ketoacidosis is not a type 1. It can be seen in patients with type 2, and about 30 to 40% of patients with diabetic ketoacidosis have type 2 diabetes. And in this country, especially in minority populations, in African Americans and in Hispanics. The other thing in epidemiology, not only in the increasing number, but we highlighted the lowering in mortality. So before the discovery of insulin, mortality was 95%. Mm. Now, in Europe and in the United States, mortality is less than 1%. The third epidemiological finding that we highlight is that we always divided DKA, HHS as two different entities. But now we know that about 20 to 35% in different countries have a characteristic of both. So they have a mixed DKA, HHS. And this is important because this patient who has mixed DKA, HHS, have higher mortality. Usually they're more sick than just those patients with individual DKA or HHS. And in the last few years, we have been using tons of SGLT2, that's right. And it works marvelous that they have been trying in patients with type 1 and patients with type 2. In type 1, it's not as approved by the FDA or by the European because of the high risk of diabetic ketoacidosis that is reported somewhere around 4 to 5%. It's also increasing the SGLT2s with patients with GKA, so we highlight risk factors. Those who have not eaten well, those who are poorly controlled, especially those who are going to be in a fasting state or because of surgery or for other reasons, they are also at risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. And the final point was COVID. We saw a significant number of patients with COVID and diabetes who presented with severe hyperglycemia and diabetic ketoacidosis with higher mortality. So about 7% of those patients with primary diagnosis of diabetes admitted with COVID went with very high glucose or diabetic ketoacidosis. So we did an extensive review of epidemiological changes, hopefully to guide not only American, but we want this to be a global. So we have input from Europeans, other countries in our guidelines. That's fantastic. There are a lot of tidbits of information in what you just shared. 
things that I was not previously aware of. A couple really stuck out for me, one being almost a third, approximately a third of the individuals with DKA actually have type 2 diabetes. And the other thing that struck me was about a quarter of the people have this mixed picture of DKA and HHS. So then that brings me to the next question is the diagnostic criteria then, right? How do we classify who has what? Yeah. And we modify some of the criteria. We discuss about the clinical presentations and we also present new guidelines on how we should diagnose both DKA and HHS. So DKA are much more common than HHS, that's right. But HHS have higher mortality, so both are quite important. So in the pure definition of DKA, we have now two different criteria. First, the glucose levels, we used to say 250. We cut it down to 200. The rationale of having a 200 was that about 10% of patients admitted with diabetic ketoacidosis are presented with glucose less than 200, what is called eoglycemic DKA. These are seen in patients who are somehow treated not intensively or patients with SGLT2s would see that in pregnancy alcoholics. So instead of 250, we want 200. More importantly, we diagnosed diabetes with 200. So why 250? So we decided 200 should be fine. The other thing that we added that a previous diagnosis of diabetes is if you have ketones, if you have metabolic acidosis, you have DKA. It doesn't matter if it's your blood glucose is 150. So a previous diagnosis of diabetes, in addition to ketones and acid-based disorder, will make a diagnosis of DKA. So glucose. Then ketones. In the United States, about 50% of hospitals still use the urine, and we measure acetoacetate to diagnose DKA. And we're not using beta-hydroxybutyrate, that is the main ketones body in those patients with DKA. In Europe, about 75-80% of hospitals do finger sticks or rapid turnaround beta-hydroxybutyrate. So they don't have that problem there. All around the world, people still use the urine. And we said, it's perfect. You can use urine to plus make a diagnosis of high ketones, but it's better to use beta-hydroxybutyrate measured by the laboratory or by point of care testing, finger sticks. And a level greater than three or two plus in the urine confirmed the diagnosis of TK. And we did not change the metabolic acidosis by pH less than 7.3 and by carbonate less than 18 millimol. In Europe, they used 15, so now they have to move up to 18 to be more inclusive, to recognize a mild diabetic ketoacidosis. So diabetic ketoacidosis is the disease, diabetes 200, or a history of diabetes, the K is ketones. Hopefully we're going to push to do more better hydroxybutyrate and the A is the acidosis by pH less than 7.3 or by carbonate less than 18. With respect to HHS, this is an area that we are working right now trying to increase more data because there are just review papers and very few investigators are focusing on HHS. And the only change was there had been a debate if you use total serum osmolality or what you call effective serum osmolality. Now we say you can do either one of them because now we have data suggesting that a total serum osmolality greater than 320 or an effective serum osmolality greater than 300 is hyperosmolar state. And that's minor differences on how do you measure them is always glucose, sodium, in the effect of serum osmolality, we don't use urea, but it's just, it's, it is the same. So the other thing is for HHS, lack of acidosis, lack of ketones. But again, one third of patients have this combined mm -hmm. HHS DKA. So we're trying to minimize this. Oh, there are two different entities in the way that a lot of people has combination of both. Excellent. And I think that's, further 
highlighted in the treatment algorithm. So let's dive into treatment. And I encourage everyone listening to check out figure four specifically. I, I, figure four is going to be a very commonly used slide, I can guarantee you, in every presentation ever. But it's a really elegant algorithm, covers the critical management of DK and HHS, but in the same algorithm. So you don't have two separate algorithms for the two entities, but together. And the pillars are still IV fluids, insulin, potassium. Now, when comparing to the 2009 update, there's some notable changes. And one of the things that really stuck out to me was the subcutaneous insulin treatment pathway, which was not there previously for mild DKA. Can you elaborate a bit further on this? And also the question about insulin use in HHS, because you know I was always taught you don't have to use insulin in HHS. Then I see within the algorithm that insulin is prominent in the HHS pathway as well. Yep, that's right. So we knew, and there were papers from 2004 in the last 20 years using sub-Q insulin for treatment of mild, uncomplicated GKA. So these are patients who has pH between 7.25 to 7.3, bicarbonate 15 to 18. They just, most of them are just because during the weekend, they stop taking the insulin for whatever reasons, and they just come. And these account for a significant number of patients. And there are eight or 10 different randomized control studies and even a meta-analysis suggesting that for mild DKA, there is no much difference if you treat them with sub-Q insulin, giving sub-Q rapid-acting insulin every one or two hours compared to IV insulin, which facilitate the care. So the use of sub-Q insulin has been around since the 70s. But at that time, we only had regular insulin, which is a very slow onset of action, long acting. Now we have rapid acting insulin, like the human lock, the novel locks of this world. So I think that's important in the way that if you give for mild DKA sub Q every one or two hours, you're going to resolve that beta ketoacidosis in the same way. So for those patients, you have the options. So if most people are treated with IV insulin, that's perfect. So it's not much different one of the others. For HHS, or a patient who has complicated GKA, so severe metabolic acidosis, but they have an acute myocardial infarction stroke that precipitates the GKA or HHS, we want to be conservative. We want to use insulin to slowly bring that glucose down and correction of the metabolic state, the acid-based disorder. So HHS is true. Not everybody after a few weeks of being HHS required to have insulin therapy. But during the acute stay, with the average blood glucose in a patient with HHS is somewhere around 800 to 900 milligrams. So these patients could treat them with fluids. That's the main reason why they develop severe dehydration and hyperglycemia. But during the acute stay, we would like to slowly bring that glucose down with insulin infusions. And then you see how we're going to manage after that. The other thing that we highlight is that forever we said use normal saline. And the European American says normal saline. During the past 10 years, there have been several randomized control studies that the crystalloid, like lactate ringer, is, is an alternative and may even have shorter duration of treatment. So we said, now you can go this way or the other. It depends on what kind of access you have in your institution. And finally is potassium. And we really emphasize the mechanisms why people develop drop in serum potassium when they are admitted during treatment. So potassium goes inside, outside the cells that is controlled by the sodium potassium HTPH and the lack of insulin doesn't work this pump. So people present with high potassium or normal potassium. But the message that we want to give to the community is that when you start insulin therapy, when you start fluid, potassium comes inside the cells. And potassium drops about one or two mil of more, one or two mil equivalent in the first 24 hours. So if you're present with low normal potassium, be aware that potassium is going to drop. And we emphasize a lot of recommendations regarding potassium because hypokalemia is associated with prolonged QT and maybe arrhythmias and maybe more complications. Thanks for that excellent summary. So again, it's figure four for everyone listening to make sure they check out 
There's a new section that I noticed on recommended management strategies for special populations, including pregnancy, SGLT2 inhibitor, and stage kidney disease. Recommend our listeners check out table four, as opposed to figure four in this case, that summarizes those recommendations. What was the inspiration to include this new section? Yeah. And in addition to the transition, we says, well, the document already have like a couple hundred references and we were limited on the amount of space you have. That's right. We, we negotiated to expand it, but that was the limit. And there was certain group of people who are associated with higher morbidity and mortality. First is the elderly, the frail adults. So I'm not sure what elderly means, but the frail adults. So these patients who are over the age of 60, 70, mortality is about 5 to 8% versus a young person who is less than 1%. And there is, most of these patients have comorbidities. They're hypertension, heart failure, kidney problems. So we emphasize how do you manage them with both insulin, be careful about hydration. If they have kidney failure, if they have heart failure, you are not going to have the same amount of hydration. So we emphasize the elderly. Pregnancy is the other, that's right. Now we see many, many patients with type 1 that now get pregnant and so we have sections about how do you manage them. Some of them come with pumps. In the United States, about 50% of these patients already are on the pump. How do you manage them? The use of continuous glucose monitoring, how do you use them in the hospital? And how do you transition those patients with IV or if they have, for example, gestational diabetes. If they present with severe hyperglycemia, you manage them. But when the baby's gone, gestational diabetes, the insulin requirements markedly reduce. So we have a sections about that. Another section is, what do you do if somebody is on SGLT2 and comes with TKA? Oh my goodness. We see this, that's right. Patients with type 1 diabetes, we don't want to use type SGLT2s because there's a risk. For patients with type 2, we are going to treat them and we're going to stop the SGLT2s. But after several weeks, month, if they have heart failure, you should do it. Mm. You just have to be aware that this patient has to have better glycemic control, insulin therapy, or make sure that they are aware of that. And now we have to do better hydroxybutyrate right, by point of care testing or urine testing just to prevent that. We recommended that, you know, if you require SGLT2 after you have, we don't have data, but it appears to be safe when you are metabolically stable. Although if you do it once, you are higher risk to do it twice. So we have a sections about that. We just have it on the table and small section in the text but it's just because the limitation in space. <laughs> but very useful, right? I mean, it's a, it's a clinical question that comes up all the time. Yeah. So very much appreciate some advice around that. And then finally, let's talk about prevention. I mean, it's great news that mortality has gone down, but still, there's still mortality associated. There's morbidity, et cetera. So what, what were some of your key messages around prevention of DKA and HHS? And Alice... Most people who present with diabetic ketoacidosis and HHS have a history of diabetes. So it should be preventable. Mm -hmm. So I mean, only 15 to 20% in young adults and even less in older adults have new onset diabetes. So who are those at risk? Those who have poorly control, especially those with type 1 with hemoglobin A1C greater than 9 they tend to have more diabetic ketoacidosis. Those who, you know, substance abuse, depression, psych disorders. So we highlight who needs to be at high risk that you have to prevent. The other thing that is important, and we highlight this in the epidemiology section, is that mortality is less than 1%, 1 or 2%. But if you have two to five admission, mortality is double. And you have more than five admission mortalities, five-fold increase. So having recurrent diabetic ketoacidosis or HHS is associated with three to four or two to five-fold increase according to the number of admissions. So this is a serious event in those people, and we recognize them. We call them frequent flyers. But man, those patients are a high risk of mortality, not just the high cost and burden to healthcare, 
very small charity. So we recommend that they have to be educated. The insulin therapy, make sure that you provide enough insulin therapy or access. They should have a red carpet. They should come to your clinic. Even if they have an appointment, they run out of insulin, you should do it. And of course, technology is the other, that's right. There are now new data that the continuous glucose monitoring may decrease the rate of diabetic ketoacidosis in this group of people because they have better glycemic control. The use of combination closed loop and other type of technologies also have been improved so much, for example, insulin pump. Now, this is a section that we want to create first awareness that having one episode, yeah, mortality is low. Multiple episodes, these are a group of people that you have to be extremely aware and follow them very careful because of the high mortality. And it should be preventable one day. Yeah, absolutely something we all need to think about. And it's interesting to think about what the future might look like with things like continuous ketone sensors and and then having even longer acting like weekly basal insulins, whether that could help protect some people. And But I agree completely with you. I think prevention really needs to be top of mind for all of us Prevention would be with three things that's right education technology that is going to change the way we treat them and access to medication that is a big problem especially in i mean i work in the community hospital in downtown atlanta with access to care and educations and social determinant of health is a daily problem to us so we have a section on social determinant of health how do you come you know, you're not going to fight, you're going to eliminate this difference, but at least how can you approach to decrease the admission for both DK and HHS? Great thoughts. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Guillermo Ampirez, for sharing your expertise with us today. And huge congratulations again to you and the rest of the international expert panel for creating this excellent consensus report on this very important topic of hyperglycemic crises with clear recommendations for diagnosis, for treatment, and very importantly, for prevention. So thanks again, Guillermo. And I encourage our listeners to read the full document in the August issue of Diabetes Care and to check out the downloadable slide set that is also available with the simultaneous publication that was in Diabetologia. So thank you again, Guillermo. Let's move on now to our rapid exchange segment where Alice and I chat about some of the articles we found particularly interesting this month. Alice, what do you have for a first pick? Well, Mike, I'm going to start with an arguably small but mighty study that can change what has been accepted practice for many years. So type 2 diabetes is reported to be more common in people living with HIV, and guidelines recommend screening for diabetes in this population. However, older studies showed that A1C testing was falsely low in people living with HIV, and therefore guidelines, including the ADA standards of care, have recommended using other glycemic tests, such as fasting plasma glucose, to screen and monitor. Now, in this month's issue, Dr. Harriet Daughtry and colleagues from the Brighton and Sussex Medical School in the United Kingdom questioned whether this was still valid given the modern treatments for HIV. They performed a prospective cohort study of people living with HIV and age and sex-matched HIV-negative participants. Each participant wore CGM for up to 10 days, had an oral glucose tolerance test, had fructosamine testing, as well as paired A1C measurements. They performed regression analyses to determine the influence of HIV on A1C, and bottom line, there was none. They also found a strong correlation between A1C and CGM mean sensor glucose, regardless of HIV status. Therefore, this small but mighty study calls into question the guideline recommendations to not use A1C to screen and monitor glucose in those living with HIV in the modern era. Mighty indeed, Alice. And these results really should have an immediate and important impact on clinical practice right now, given the simplicity of screening and monitoring by hemoglobin A1C without the requirement for fasting or the time required to complete an oral glucose tolerance test, these findings really should be a great help for individuals living today with HIV. My first pick is by Dr. 
Celeste Dernwald from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, which is my institution that I say proudly as well as by way of full disclosure. <laughs> Celeste is reporting on outcomes from the glucose levels across maternity or GLAM study. Dr. Dernwald and colleagues who also include faculty from the International Diabetes Center in St. Louis Park, Minnesota, and the Jabe Center for Health Research in Tampa, Florida, examine continuous glucose monitoring or CGM metrics in early pregnancy from 768 women followed to their 24 to 28 week gestation oral glucose tolerance test. 58 women were diagnosed with gestational diabetes at the time of that oral glucose tolerance test, and they had higher levels of CGM glycemia noted as early as 13 to 14 weeks of gestation that persisted until that 24 to 28 week OGTT. And these women represented 8% of the study cohort where earlier identification of disordered glucose metabolism in pregnancy is possible and could help further mitigate gestational risk. Now, first of all, I absolutely love the name of the study, right? The GLAM study. That's not something that I would totally enroll in if I qualified. But, but as a, but separate from that, I think this is this is very exciting because I, as we learn more, we may be able to not only better predict who will develop GDM, because that's what this study is certainly suggesting, but also perhaps one day, and maybe this is wishful thinking on my part, maybe we can do away with the inconvenience of the OGTT completely and be able to use more modern techniques, shall we say, such as CGM to better identify those who are at risk. So great choice there, Mike. Thank you. Now, my next pick is also along the lines of trying to predict the future a little bit better. So Dr. Mohamed Gawash and colleagues from the International Type 1 Diabetes Intelligence, or T1DI study group, characterized distinct islet autoantibody profiles to better predict who will progress to type 1 diabetes. They utilized data from 1,845 genetically susceptible, prospectively observed children who were positive for at least one islet autoantibody. Using information such as age of onset of islet autoantibody and type of islet autoantibody, they identified five main clusters of individuals and determined their five-year risk of developing stage 3 type 1 diabetes. The highest risk group were children who first developed insulin autoantibody, or IAA, in early life, median age of about 1.6 years, followed by developing GAD antibodies at around 1.9 years of age, and then islet antigen 2 antibody, or IA2A, around median 2.1 years of age. This was the highest risk group. Their five-year risk was 69.9% or 70%, with 10-year risk of almost 90%, so very high-risk individuals. The subsequent groups, all with declining risk, were those as follows. Persistent insulin autoantibody and anti-GAD was the next highest risk group. Then the group below that, was persistent anti-GAD and islet antigen 2 antibody. Then the group below that was predominant GAD antibodies. And then lastly, the lowest risk group with the 10-year risk of only 4% was the cluster who had single transient autoantibodies. Now, to me, this has the potential to allow for better personalized decision-making around treatments as well as enrollment in clinical trials. Absolutely, Alice. And as we heard in the interview this episode with Dr. Albanese O'Neill and Linda Meglio, the guidance that they've provided around how frequently individuals with islet autoantibody positive pre-stage 3 type 1 diabetes require monitoring for disease progression may also be personalized using these kinds of data. My next pick comes from Dr. Danielle Hessler at the University of California, San Francisco, and colleagues who conducted EMBARC, a randomized clinical trial of three interventions aimed at reducing diabetes distress and hemoglobin A1C among adults living with type 1 diabetes. 276 individuals with elevated measures of both diabetes distress and hemoglobin A1C at baseline 
were randomized to receive one of three virtual interventions that each lasted about three to four months. Streamline, a diabetes educator-led self-management program, tuned in, a psychologist-led emotion-focused program, or fix it, a program that integrated elements of both Streamline and tuned in. And while all three interventions demonstrated substantive and sustained reductions in diabetes distress and hemoglobin A1C, it was actually tuned in that showed the most consistent benefits with more than half of individuals lowering their diabetes distress score to less than two and their hemoglobin A1C by 0.5 percentage points or more at 12 months. So these findings really highlight the value for integrating group-based, virtual, and time-limited programs into clinical practice that address the emotional burden of type 1 diabetes that affects self-management, and by doing so can really lead to improved health outcomes. A really important study because I think it's a, a reminder, and we see this in clinical practice every day, the importance of the emotional aspect, the mental health component, and its contribution to physical health. And I mean, the A1C lowering, for example, is certainly in the category of what we would consider significant if it was a pharmacotherapy, right? So I think that this is absolutely an important study to be aware of. And again, whoever came up with the names did a great job of the names for the different programs. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk about a different population. So my final pick is an important analysis from the Practice Changing Select study. And this is one of several analyses that were presented at the recent ADA scientific sessions. Now, the Select study, just to remind our audience, is a study of semaglutide, 2.4 milligrams a week versus placebo, that demonstrated reduced cardiovascular outcomes with semaglutide in a population with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and a BMI of 27 plus with no type 2 diabetes at baseline. So really the first time demonstrating the effect of a GLP-1 receptor agonist as a cardiovascular agent outside of the diabetes space. Now, this sub-analysis that was published in the August issue of Diabetes Care looked at categories of glycemia and movement among those categories, bearing in mind that none of these people had diabetes at baseline. Of the 17,604 participants at baseline, about 34% had normal glycemia, defined as an A1C under 5.7%. About 35% had an A1C 5.7 to 5.9. And about 32% had A1C 6 to 6.4%. So essentially, a third, a third, a third. Now, at week 156, about 70% of the semaglutide-treated group had normal glycemia, compared to only about 36% of the placebo-treated group. Among those with a baseline A1C of 6 to 6.4%, so our highest risk group for progression, an impressive 47%, so nearly half, had normal glycemia at week 156, compared to only 9% in the placebo group. A further analysis was conducted to determine how much of this effect was driven by weight change. Among those with an A1C of 5.7% or greater at baseline, only about 27% of the effect to induce regression to normal glycemia was mediated through weight change. Looking at it differently, you could consider what about progression to diabetes? If looking at that, only 34.5% of the effect to prevent progression to diabetes could be accounted for by weight change. So therefore, in this population at risk of developing diabetes, semaglutide had a favorable impact on glycemia and shifting more people into normal glycemia and fewer people progressing to diabetes with the weight change only accounting for about 30% of the effect. Those are really impressive results, Alice, and allowing us to really think about pharmacotherapy for diabetes prevention that is not just about slowing the progression from prediabetes to type 2 diabetes, but in fact, actually, in many of these individuals who demonstrate reversal of their impaired glucose homeostasis back towards normal. And to 
piggyback on that one, Alice, my final pick is another analysis from the select trial in this issue of Diabetes Care, where Dr. Ildigo Lingve from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas and colleagues examine whether that baseline or change in hemoglobin A1C that occurred during the trial affected the cardiovascular disease outcomes. So was glucose important for the benefit in cardiovascular disease events? And the authors found that the 20% reduction of first major adverse cardiovascular event afforded by semaglutide, 2.4 milligrams weekly from baseline through the 20 weeks of intervention was consistent across the range of baseline A1C values that you discussed, Alice, from normal through the lower ends to the higher ends of the pre-diabetes range. And also regardless of the change in hemoglobin A1C, which was on average about 0.3 percentage points lower with semaglutide than placebo throughout the study. So people with overweight or obesity and pre-existing cardiovascular disease who do not have diabetes, semaglutide reduces the risk of experiencing a future cardiovascular disease event independent of its effects on glycemia. And so these results now extend the cardiovascular benefit of semaglutide among those with pre-existing cardiovascular disease across the glycemic spectrum, all the way to those with normal glucose tolerance. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really great to see these kind of results. And it personally makes me grateful that we're living in this time where there's all these great options to be able to offer people. And that implementation, though, is really going to be the key. And with that, one last thing that I want to bring up to our audience is that at the recent ADA scientific sessions, there was a fantastic diabetes care symposium that was entitled, and I absolutely love this title as a Trekkie, The Final Frontier in Diabetes Care, Implementing Research in Real-World Practice. The accompanying review article is included in this month's issue by Drs. Jennifer Green, Matthew Crowley, Satish Thirunavukarasu, Nisa Marather, and Brian Oldenburg. In addition, as a special treat, the symposium itself will be available for viewing on the Diabetes Care website, too. So we talked a lot in these podcasts about wonderful therapies that have been shown to be effective, but bringing them to life is probably the greatest challenge that we all have now. And as the symposium title says, the final frontier. So I encourage everyone to take a listen to it. And this brings us to the end of our August 2024 episode of Diabetes Care on Air. A big thank you to Drs. Guillermo Umperez, Anastasia Albanese O'Neill, and Linda Demeglio for spending time with us this episode. Remember that Diabetes Care is continuing to take submissions of original art for consideration to be included on a future journal cover. Don't forget to subscribe to get notifications when new episodes come out. And thank you for listening.